welcome everybody you are at the right place it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this session which is titled boon bane or bust can our planet survive tech so a certain provocative uh, kind of punch to the title and in fact uh, this goes with this year's sci-fi's uh, reflective tenor sci-fi this year urges us to pause think and ask what is the right narrative on our relationship with technology what are the right choices and how can the path dependency of digital technology be inflected with human will we must of course dig deeper about our relationship with digital technologies this is complex it concerns us our data the way our data determines our destinies individually and collectively and significantly how data that is not of human origin is situated in this mix so we are talking about joining the dots between us our social context the natural and built environment and the systemic norms and rules all of which will then co-determine how this ecosystem looks and what it will deliver so a crucial point of concern here arises in the way the planet is being codified this is not simply about um doing science in the lab or statistical modeling in ai labs the norms and standards redefining the planet through data and ai are powerful and in fact post human scholars have vested agency in these things right so the internet of things is not just inert it actually has agency to shift something very very deep in late august august this year developing countries pointed to how digital sequence information is the elephant in the room in the biodiversity discussions providing a loophole for developed countries to circumvent the access and benefit sharing rules under the convention on biodiversity why did they say that the fact of the matter is that the well-being of the planet is confronted with a very weak link the fact of data and ai regimes rewriting the rules for people planet prosperity and indeed the prospects of posterity what the instance of digital sequence information shows you is that we are talking not about a regime for sharing the gains of bio resources but for sharing the gains of informational and knowledge resources about bio resources so how then should we contemplate the steps the standards to put people and planet at the center what is the will and the wisdom necessary for the planet to survive tech dystopia as the title of this session urges us to do be it the ecological collateral of celebrated innovations like crypto or the insidious ways by which runaway global finance ties in with web 3.0 for greenwashing in other words and i'm trying to be uh, you know gen z here what does hashtag coding planet look like both in the way data science develops and in the way the rules evolve for data science so our excellent organizing team here has identified just the right questions and the most superlative panel to answer these questions for us i have here the honor and pleasure of a conversation with sanjay joshi chairman observer research foundation india sanjay is an energy and climate expert with special interest in sustainable development issues i have howda chidi founder ICT Innovation Lab from Tunis she is a telecom expert and champion for women in tech and um development i also have janet selam founder of footprint lab australia janet has also been with the unep before and i have subrita kumar mitra head of government and industry relations at exxon india so without ado um what we'll do is turn to this uh, august panel and set for a conversation which i really hope you will be able to participate in what we are going to do is divide this session in two bits one is to initially lay out the problem statement and then we will come into what kind of uh, frontiers of innovation we would really like to see so over to you sanjay uh thanks neeta for that uh, introduction uh, very well laid out the scheme of the discussion we're going to have uh the when we start talking of uh, the issue of technology and climate change and we start framing it in terms of boon or bust let me tell you uh, by now i've lost enough gray hairs on my head to be seduced by either side of the narrative 
So there is, you know, if you start looking at uh, the way it is currently framed, the debate is framed, you know, you have on the one side estimates like uh, Anders Andreas, uh, that if ICT technology goes on the way it is going, then by 2025, that's three years from now, it will be consuming 25% of all of global energy. That is one estimate. But the fact is that, you know, uh, the, the kind of advances you've been seeing in computational efficiency over the years, they've been phenomenal. The, the energy efficiency has risen tremendously. If uh, I were still to use, uh, we were still using in our hands devices, uh, which were akin to the Cray supercomputers of old, uh, and uh, my mobile today does exactly that, and still using that in energy terms today, uh, just the data consumption of, a, of the national capital region of Delhi would be enough to take down the grid of the entire world, not just India, many times over. So that is why we've, reached, we've made phenomenal gains and we are making phenomenal gains all the time in this fr framework. So that is one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is, no, you, uh, I just read something from the, some of those quoting, the World Wildlife Fund saying that by 2030, and worldwide I had fun saying it, you know, I don't know what they were doing talking about information technology, uh, that uh, efficiencies from smart devices and systems will potentially reduce CO2 emissions by eight gigatons by 2030, which is a reduction of 20%. Now these are both very, very extreme narratives, the boon or bust narrative as it is being framed. The fact is that uh, you know, neither of them is really correct. These are very political framings of the entire debate. And there are particular reasons why these get framed in, the way, in, the, in these very, very binary terms. And there's no under denying the fact uh, that, yes, blockchain technology, uh, you know, data centers do consume large amounts of energy, large amounts of computational power. And it also makes it then very easy for you know, ex uh, the, uh, central banks like the ECB to argue and give arguments like uh, estimates of the carbon footprint for Bitcoin and Ether show just carbon and uh, uh, foot for Bitcoin. They're talking about Ether and Bitcoin. Estimates for their carbon footprint show that they combine yearly emissions as of May 2022 negate all past and future targeted greenhouse gas emission savings for most of Euro area countries. That is, I'm quoting from one of the reports. And there you have then China's near total Bitcoin ban, which comes cloaked in the guise of climate action, saying that they're consuming far too much energy. Uh, but secretively also trying to push the digital yuan. So there are lots of you know, political reasons for the debate to get framed in these very boon or bust type of uh, uh, frameworks. Actually, uh, no, uh, if you ask me, I'm neither with the prophets of doom and neither with the prophets of Davos. The one thinks that this is the end, the other tends to think that uh, this information technology is going to solve every possible problem, including climate change in Jiffy. Neither of them is actually correct. So we will hold that secret of who should be correct for the next round. But taking off from you, Sanjay, and turning to Janet, I'd, um, uh, maybe I can uh, go over to you, Howdy, then. Um, what do you think, from your own work, is really uh, connecting back to the an energy crisis? Do you agree with Sanjay that there is no problem? Sure. Uh, so hello. I start by uh, greeting everyone. Hello. So uh, thank you for uh, the uh, Anita for the great introduction. So I want to share some uh, my thoughts about uh, uh, how to be uh, or the trends of a green tech, starting by the problem. Uh, in fact, there is a paradox of innovation of uh, or uh, digitalization. So uh, technology is at the same time helping our environment and hurting it. In the way that we have to focus about uh, in uh, green uh, of tech and uh, ICT in uh, through uh, greening through ICT. Uh, so, in the way that the, the first side is uh, that the, the, the emerging technology, the progress of emerging technology leads to uh, improvement of energy efficiency through the using of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, or industry 4.0, or uh, nowadays we speak about industry 5.0. In other side, Another example of the hurting of uh, technology of our environment is the, uh, the consequence of, a pa of uh, the pandemic that we still, uh, still suffer from it. It is uh, uh, the consequence of the great pressure 
of uh, the carbon emission of uh, the emerging technology. So here, uh, this, is, this is the first point of uh, the disadvantages of the, uh, and that's the, the emerging technology. The second point is uh, the emerging technology could be also uh, a solution. As an example, we, nowadays we speak about industry 5.0 or digital twin, which is uh, a virtualization of cities or uh, or the overall country or human beings. And uh, we can do tests or a simulation to test if uh, the feasibility of uh, uh, some modification. And if, it, uh, if everything is OK, we can pass to the, uh, the deployment. Other thing, the second point is we need standardization of uh, and the rules to, uh, for, to, for every technology to measure the carbon emission. Because uh, it's, uh, we need, here we need uh, to a strong conversation between different actors, regulators, civil society, academia. They have to uh, connect with it, each other and uh, uh, some experts from environment to give uh, thoughts to focus uh, about uh, what is the strong KPIs. For example, if we, we are working or, or uh, uh, connecting with vendors, uh, it's important to uh, speak about a KPA for the network emission because nowadays, uh, overall operator implementing new technologies, so virtualization, cloudification, uh, 5G, 6G, but they don't care about uh, the carbon emissions. So here we have to focus about a statement of uh, efficient KPAs to, uh, to uh, focus about or to measure the carbon emission. Uh, other thing, it, it is here, uh, we open the door about decarbonization of companies or green of companies. Here we Maybe have... we can come back to that in the next round. Okay, Is that okay. okay? I sure. I just wanted to take off from where you left with respect to the paradox of technology, Janet, and since you've been in the policy space and you also now have your own lab, um, how do you actually see... Um, this gap between practice and policy, and where do you think really the problem lies? Yeah, thank you very much. So, so I spent 17 years at the United Nations working on policy and developing innovation programs, um, and now I've started my own co company working on one of those areas which just I couldn't stop obsessing about. So uh, I'll go into that in a sec. The, the key thing in the policy is that all of these technologies um, and this technology revolution that we have that has taken on the burden of change in society, which environmentalists could never we could never have achieved, we need to piggyback on that. So the key policy is that to have a social license to operate these technology providers need to uh, take the lead on environmental policy. So we see Facebook and Google that, are, that have made promises about um, renewable energy development for their data centers. Uh, we've seen companies like Lyft and Uber commit to integration of EV fleets into their fields. Um, why not extend this? You know, if you're running a satellite, you need to dedicate some time for Earth observation. So this is the policy thing we need to engage these companies um, and in order for them to operate, as, as Sanjay said, they're causing a lot of environmental problems, but they've also got their finger on, on solutions. Um, so that's where I see um, the policy interplay and the three key problems that I think uh, that, that are quite cross-cutting. There's many problems, but three problems I think that tech can really solve. Uh, one is lack of transparency. So we really need a digital twin for everything that happens around here. And a huge area of opportunity here is fintech because they have so much data about all the money flows um, and they have that potential to enrich it. Um, so we, we can make the, those digital twins of things. Also use of satellites and remote sensing IoT. Second problem is for the circular economy, there's a huge gap in the efficiency of logistics. We need to move things around efficiently, get them to the right place. They talk about like a, an Uber for recycling and a Tinder for materials, uh, get them to the right place. Um, so that can be solved by IoT and the, the, the wide use of mobile data, those amazing supercomputers in our pockets. 
Um, lastly, recycling. We just heard uh, it's in headlines that plastics were only recycled at 5%. It's even worse for e-waste. Uh, why? When we're going to asteroids for new materials, we're going to deep sea, why can't we recycle? And this is where it's the robotic sector. It's machine vision. It's digital tags uh, that are imperceptible to us but could be a small thing uh, that, that, uh, that is detectable by a robot. So these are some of the areas, not all, where I think we have huge problems in order for the tech sector to move forward, to have that social license to operate. Um, and not only that, the, the huge energy consumption they have, they need to advance on the solution side, which we'll come to you next. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was extremely perceptive. I just wanted to turn to Subrato and uh, wanted to pick up on a couple of things that Janet said, including the circular economy and perhaps also going back to the 2020 report from Ericsson, you know, on breaking the energy curve. And how do you frame the problem? Okay. Uh, thanks, Anita. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I'll speak from the telecommunication sector. Uh, telecom, our research shows that we consume almost 0.6% of the global energy today, and our emission footprint is almost 0.2% of the that. Now, while that's a small number uh, compared to, say, other sectors, the effort is to bring it down. And one of the driving factors is uh, if you see the generations of technology from 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, we have been consuming more power because you have been consuming more data, so obviously it needs to be powered. Uh, the, the industry was very clear, and we were very clear that if we follow the same trend, uh, the energy consumed that we will do in 5G because you'll be consuming 10 times more data. As an industry, we could not consume 10 times more energy. Then we would go bust if I have to agree with Dr. Joshi. So uh, we felt very clear that we need to break the energy curve. And I think uh, here ITU's net zero standards came in. And what we did internally was to find out that you need to bring down the energy consumption. And the effort of the industry and everyone here is by, by the end of 5G, can you keep your energy level same as what it was 4G, despite consumers and industries consuming 10 to 20 times more data. Uh, this one. The second issue is on the circular economy is that uh, telecom is a very complex uh, sector. Uh, you have old technologies in the network. Uh, you just cannot overnight shift them out, unlike, say, a consumer device like which you replace when you get an energy efficient. So we'll have to find ways and means of how do you ensure uh, that those get phased out over a period of time because they are the ones who are consuming uh, more energy. And the third is how do you ensure, I agree with the speakers here, how do you ensure you are able to recycle more? How do you get more uh, the supply chain, the overall supply chain to be more uh, green and uh, take effort towards the net zero target as what the industry has said. Uh, Anita, I'll pause here. Yes, thanks so much. So uh, to go forward to our next round, I think we might want to shift frames to really ask the question, what should we be doing so that our planet survives the tech, or to perhaps cut out the polemic because there's no need to characterize tech as essentially something that is bad. I think it might be useful to go back to how then to frame the political narrative correctly. Uh, the planet will survive tech, don't worry. Whether humans survive it is a different That's a question. Relief. I can have <laughs> no, no, the question is will humans survive it? You know, that, that is the more tricky question. And in what form will civilization survive tech? Uh, that is the more relevant question. Uh, but you know, breaking the energy curve, if you talk of breaking the energy curve, and you know, Janet spoke about it, and Subrutu spoke about it. Uh, see, there are two sides to the energy curve. There's a demand side, there's a supply side. As far as the demand side is concerned, I think there have been phenomenal gains which the IT industry has made and has been making, and Moore's Law has helped them do it. Very, very dramatically, phenomenally, they, they've been doing it. The problems do not rise so much. You know, I, I, I completely agree with Subrato what they will do about 5G and everything else. So the fact is that with IR4, with, as with every other industrial revolution, there are going to be phenomenal efficiency gains, yes. But please understand, that with every transformation in the means of production, your energy consumption does not go down, it'll go up. It'll go up for the simple reason that you are finding new ways of consuming energy. 
you're finding new consumers. People who never consume data are going to be consuming data. The kind of devices which will come in, when you move on to the Internet of Things, there'll be thousands of uh, kinds of devices coming into this world. Robotics will bring in thousands of devices. So energy consumption, and I don't think we should have any qualms about saying it, energy consumption, efficiency will rise, but so will energy consumption rise. So the solutions then, there are solutions on the demand side which are being addressed, but then there are deeper solutions on the supply side which must be addressed. And the solutions to many of these problems which will keep on arising on the supply side are today far from being resolved. And there are lots of reasons why they are far from being resolved. I don't want to get into that debate. I want to confine myself to the, you know, basically the IR4 and the technology sector. So maybe in the next round I'll speak about where the problems lie within the IR4 in the tech sector and what are the challenges it will need to face. Um, Sanjay, why don't you go ahead because I think, uh, um, in fact, I was just going to say that I read this article today about the non-renewable energy um, related uh, outlook that the World Energy Outlook Report 2022 yeah, talks yeah, about yeah. and it says things will get worse before they get better. So we would like to hear from you. So we conclude this round and then open it up for discussion. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, See, I think the world energy uh, outlook is uh, both optimistic and positive, positive because they have to be positive about it. They are, this report is primarily written in the context of the Ukraine war. And yes, that has thrown, uh, no, uh, drawn a dark line across the energy landscape. And today, and that brings me back to the whole question of you know, what happens to IR4, the Internet of Things, and when we are looking at technologies which are basically built on collaborative sharing networks. So ultimately, they grow because you can collaborate and share. Now, if the world refuses to collaborate and share, what happens to them? Do even democracies agree on sharing many of these uh, concerns? So I think the big challenge which we face today, and I'm talking in the context of the World Economic Outlook Report is, uh, we are no longer in a sharing frame of mind, we are no longer in a collaborative frame of mind, so therefore these very dark predictions which they're making. I don't presume we're going to stay here forever, because if we're going to stay here forever, uh, then yes, uh, human beings won't survive. So uh, let's, let's write that solution off. We will move beyond this, we have to get back to collaborative frameworks and decide on where we do it, and there, yes, uh, IR4, can play a major role. There are huge challenges because IR4 basically is built in the idea concept of systems integration. There are challenges in systems integration. And these are challenges which not just companies face, these are challenges which countries face, these are challenges which communities face. And what are these challenges? The, the challenges are very simple. You know, there are, if, if you start talking even say, it's very popular to talk of the three Ps, to talk of uh, the triple bottom line, people, or say planet, people, profits. Actually, it is never in that order. It will always be the other way around. Profits, then perhaps people, then perhaps planet. And there is an inherent competition when you start talking of strategies, corporate strategies, national strategies, community strategies, individual strategies. There is a conflict, inherent competition between these three bottom lines. How are you going to be resolving that competition? So, A, that systems integration for any company, for any enterprise to achieve is not easy, is difficult. There are regulatory barriers. If you start talking of collaborating networks, yes, there are regulatory barriers there too. If you start talking of Web 3.0, building open source software, there are, there are barriers to those kinds of collaboration coming up. So, there is a long road ahead of us. And eventually, we start thinking of the transformative power of uh, the IR4. See, any change in the means of production ultimately it does not happen without transforming the institutions which have propelled the last one. I think ultimately a lot of the work which happens in this sector is going to happen in the gray zone until it is ready to break forth. So let us see whether, when, when that point comes, that inflection point. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, after the discussion, perhaps we will return to this and how we could aspire for uh, collaboration that is that utopia, I don't know. So over to you to really understand, you know, as a layperson in terms of even grasping the politics of greening, it often gets extremely confusing as to are you really talking about real possibilities or is it part of greenwashing because of the nexus between the ways in which crypto tokens, Web 3.0 and others work. So over to you. 
So, uh, if uh, to speak about uh, green tech, first step is uh, to understand and we need transparency from uh, companies using uh, emerging technology about the amount of carbon emission. This is the first step. After that, uh, we can use uh, small steps or uh, in our uh, lives uh, using technology. For, exa for example, uh, we don't need sometimes uh, to use planet or to travel. Uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can proceed with uh, remotely conferences and we have this, uh, we learned this from our experience of uh, COVID or of us, uh, we work remotely and it's uh, good done. So it uh, helps to uh, reduce and, and monitor uh, carbon emission. This, uh, this is the first step. The second step we can uh, think about, for example, using GPS for the driving in our uh, journey to not uh, taking a long time. We can use it to, uh, smart vehicles or autonomous vehicles that help us for parking very fast. This is if we don't use or if we don't think about el electrical vehicle. If we use traditional vehicle about oil and uh, we can uh, start by using sm smart uh, ICT, let's say. Uh, the second task uh, is to uh, to connect with. Uh, uh, we need a communication between our actors, civil society, academia, research, regulatory, to know uh, to know more uh, uh, about uh, the rules that we have for law, and we ha we have to state for every company is using emerging technology uh, to to pass to or to focus about the route to net zero. This, is, uh, this uh, should be the focus of all companies using uh, emerging technology is to focus about neutrality of uh, the environment because it is a responsibility of uh, our uh, human beings. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I think on that note, Janet, it would be useful to hear from you um, with respect to your uh, identification of certain important technological frontiers like mm -hmm. fintech. Um, as uh, significant, uh, what do you think should be the locus of this shift and this change? Yeah. Um, I mean, Huda mentioned the impact of the pandemic. One of the big impacts of the pandemic is cashless or digital uh, transactions. So this has opened up a huge um, uh, in interface between society and information between behind um, all these supply chains uh, that we did w would unconnected uh, from before. So um, so I'd like to talk about fintech and digital product passports. First, fintech. So um, now the environment movement, we have um, come a long way. We now can tell you the carbon footprint per dollar for any sector and any country. That's what Footprint Lab is working on. Once you know that spend-based carbon footprint, you can then integrate that into fintech, whether that's smart receipts, payments, uh, or any kind of digital transactions, ESG portfolios, etc. So that's the first step is integrating that layer um, or that enrichment of sustainability data onto this new wave of, of data that's been a ma made available by, by fintech. Um, coupled with that, another innovation that I think is, is, is really amazing and the EU is going to, uh, is now working on bringing it out, is uh, the digital product passports. So imagine if every item that you had had its own digital passport that would enable the producer to track where it's gone through that life cycle and empower everyone along the way to circulate it, through circular economy, maybe the hotel doesn't need these anymore, maybe the hotel next door does. Um, you can put it on a secondhand channel with its digital product passport. Maybe a component is broken, the product passport would contain info about how to fix fine components. And finally, every product, everything around you is, is one day going to be waste. Um, it would then contain information about what to do about that product uh, once it, how to 
manage it responsibly and hopefully get it into the right um, hands so that they can recycle it appropriately and bring it back again into the circular economy instead of uh, a landfill somewhere. So these digital product passports, again, can be attached through fintech to transactions as they, they flow through the economy. So the, these are two areas where I think tech um, can really enable that digital twin. And then other technologies, AI has been mentioned, can help us to optimize what's going on in these supply chains. Um, other, other technologies, can, like um, there are lots of different tools now about um, avoiding greenwashing. So instead of a company just highlighting one or two green initiatives, um, if we can use these tools to look at their full supply chain, their full general ledgers, um, and then see really where all these dollars, what's happening behind all of these dollars um, more comprehensively, uh, and we do need standards for that. So there is a role for international policy. Um, but that's coming. Um, there's a partnership for carbon accounting financials, which has committed over 300 financial institutions with $80 trillion between them to reporting on the scope three emissions of their full portfolios. Now, they're going to be asking companies within their portfolios, what's your carbon footprint? And those companies are going to be asking their supply chains, what's your carbon footprint? So we really need a way to make this all mainstream, easier, um, and technology, I think, will, will help us find it as long as they, they help us green energy systems uh, and recycling all that e-waste as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And I think that it is actually that uh, interaction and interface between technology and the way in which regulation and technology and, and at that sweet spot, you know, whatever is, uh, uh, whatever fructifies. I think in the conversation around autonomous vehicles, emerging technology, you know, optimization of supply chains is this question about uh, efficiency. And uh, I uh, recall our conversation just before this panel on how you envision at Ericsson the ways by which you can reinvent cities, perhaps. So. Uh, thanks, Anita. Um, from the industry side, what we are looking is primarily three major approaches to, uh, you know, break this uh, energy curve and to meet the net zero targets. Uh, the first is internal efficiencies within the organizations. Uh, bring down the energy consumption of the products that we are doing and for that first we checked it out internally does it work and between 2016 to 2021 we brought down our CO2 emission consumption within the company by around 60 odd percent and we believe it works. Uh, we also brought down our emission calculation internally by 35 percent and products uh, the energy consumption of the products down and now we believe that as an industry we are confident of uh, doing that. The second what uh, uh, as an endeavor is on is that we need to transform the uh, global telecommunication sector into 5G. Uh, 5G is a efficient technology when it comes to spectrum consumption. Uh, the cost per GB is normally how operates, operators calculate their cost. It is the most efficient compared even to 4G and power consumptions are down. And uh, if you see the mobile operators uh, worldwide, the cost of electricity or the cost of energy is almost 20 to 40 percent of your OPEX. So imagine any industry, uh, if your energy cost is 20 to 40 percent, the entire focus is that. And we strongly believe uh, that 5G, because it consumes less power, we will be able to help the operators when they move on to 5G, it will bring down the, uh, you know, the cost for them. And obviously everyone is going to benefit from that. So transitioning to this 5G will be extremely critical. It has started in India. Uh, it just almost now 200 networks are already uh, moved on to 5G out of the 800 odd globally. So the trend is on. And we believe as they move on to uh, 5G, uh, they will be transitioning from the older uh, generations and those will be switching down in some countries, for example, 2G and 3G is no more available. So you're moving to the newer generation of technology, uh, which are more energy efficient. And the last part is what we are looking at, how can you use more IoT? Our calculation shows uh, deploying IoT by 2030, which will happen, will bring down around 15% of the emission in the entire ICT sector. Second is use more renewable energies. 
So one of the thing is using solar power and fuel cells in all those individual radio sites what you see, you know, which are either on the rooftop or on the street. How do you bring them in and do away with the diesel generator which are normally as a backup? So that's something that trend is happening around the world. Uh, in India also you're bringing in a lot of batteries in to replace the uh, generators and make them more green. And third is use more AI and machine learning in the network to see that how it can be more, more efficient uh, to, for example, we are talking about can you put certain, uh, you know, equipment to sleep mode depending on the consumption pattern. So today, for example, when you walk out of a room, the lights normally switch off. Uh, you, if you don't watch your TV for some time, they normally switch off. So now what the industry is working is that can you have these kind of technologies at the network level, depending on how you're consuming uh, or when you're using the network and if you're not using the network, can it be put on to a, a sleep mode? However, please understand this is a, a essential service so you just can't switch off the radio for saving because even if one individual comes and let's say this, this area, let's assume that traffic shows in the midnight no one is using, so can I switch it off? No, it can't happen because even if one individual comes in, one citizen comes in, the network has to be on because it is mission critical. So this is where AI will come in that based on the usage patterns and all and huge amount of new software which will determine that how can you uh, you know, switch the equipment off in a sleep mode so that whenever the user comes back into that area, the network is again on. So these are some of the initiatives which are already on and we are confident by uh, 2030, you will see the telecom industry as a whole will, uh, you know, move towards this, uh, uh, you know, net zero uh, targets that we have set. Thanks so much. I think a uh, singularly optimistic panel and of course, a lot of food for thought. What we can do now is... Uh, Maybe take three interventions, uh, questions or comments, and then we won't have more time. Please direct your comments or questions at uh, anybody in the panel. Then after your questions, then maybe we can let the panel speak and then close. So yourself. Hello, my name is Afef. I'm coming from Tunisia, North Africa, and I'm working on the climate justice. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot to say <laughs> about that. Uh, we never say that technology is bad uh, or it's not something good, but we need to be responsible on using technology because there is misawareness about the impact of technology or ICT sector on the climate. Uh, and for example, uh, uh, the, data, the data centers, they are participating um, like uh, they impacting uh, the, the climate like the same as the flights and the same as, as like taking a flight and travel. So it's the same thing, you know. So now we're talking about taking less the flight, but we don't talk about using less emails, for example, or uh, don't putting a lot of attachment on the emails or something like that, you know. So uh, we, uh, we need to be more responsible on that. And one of the solution is to raise awareness maybe about uh, the impact of technology on the climate change and on the carbon emission. So talk with these uh, companies working on the ICT sector and raise awareness about that and giving them solutions. Uh, here is how you can still make money. Capitalism is always here. <laughs> and this is the main, uh, uh, you know, um, um, how we say, like, the, 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 we fight capitalism. It's here and it will stay here. And people, they want to make money. They don't care about the climate. Uh, so how to put strategies and how to put, like, papers for these companies working on the ACT to make them make money, but protecting the environment and reduce their energy consumption. So this uh, energy uh, consumption, this, this one of the, for example, uh, solutions that we can do. Uh, we can make like more advo advocacy as well about, uh, about, uh, about how to reduce and about how to make, uh, to make uh, less uh, usage of this uh, technology or how to replace like re replacing the technology but, uh, or having a responsible usage of technology. Could I request um, you to, in the interests of others, participation just wrap up in a Yes, yes, I'm, I just finished, uh, I'm just finished. And also I need to know, uh, to say that, that because it's my domain. <laughs> so that's why I need to, to tell uh, things. Uh, and uh, the, the other thing, the, uh, this strategy or this policy that we need to talk, that to, we need to make, it, it shouldn't come mainly from the government, but it should come from us, from the community, and then providing solutions to the government. And we will need the support of the government to make this strategy happen to reduce the carbon emission in the ICT sector. That's it. Yes, thanks so much for that. You had a Thank you. Uh, 
My name is Surinder Singh and I'm a Kambaran auditor with the UN designated operation uh, entity. I was planning to ask something else, but then in the course of discussion, I'm, 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 I'm on to something. Uh, I've seen this before as well. When I talk to these companies who are emitting the carbon, they do not even know how much. Uh, I would request you all, anyone can respond to the question. Uh, I think we have already missed the bus, not according to me, but IPCC, that the safe emission level was 1970s. I wasn't even born at that time. Now, if you are going to focus on the efficiency, then or perhaps somebody suggested the response should be or could be to reduce the emission would be solar. But the question is, it's expensive. I'm working on a strategy or rather a methodology, the first agro based methodology for so that carbon, uh, farmers can participate in carbon market. But the solar is way too expensive. And there's no way to make it more efficient. And if we keep on riding on the efficiency uh, bus, We've already missed it. Who's going to pay for it first? And second, where would the money come from? Hi, I'm uh, Pamod Damarakon, uh, uh, representing DHIS2, which is a di uh, digital public good and from uh, University of Oslo, Norway. So uh, there was an interesting comment uh, mentioning that the way, the trajectory we are going, the planet uh, might, might be saved, but not the life on it. So there is this... Uh, uh, approach which has been driven by the U most of the UN agencies, including WHO, FAO, called One Health, last five years. So I, I'm just curious to know, like all these discussions that we had, because the thing is, like this, all these uh, UN agencies at uh, regional and country level, they are asking nowadays to align all their initiatives with this One Health approach. So all these tech interventions we have discussed, how aligned are we with this One Health approach, or kind of we are going on a different path? Yeah. Oh, feel free to pick up any of those. So we just start from Janet. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not familiar with the One Health approach. I thought I thought I'd um, um, have an answer for that one. Um, but on the on the data centers, yes, they they use a lot of energy. That's why I think the the social license to operate them um, needs to be attached with the requirement that the equivalent amount of renewable energy is purchased to to power them. Uh, Google has done this. Facebook has done this. I'm I'm not sure of others. I think perhaps Apple, and they're also investing a lot in in the efficiency. Well, I take your point that we've missed the boat to just depend on efficiency. Um, but I, I mean, all these discussions about which sector, sometimes I do wish that societies or countries could say, what is my carbon budget? How much energy can I produce within that carbon budget um, according to the technologies I have available? And then that's what's available. You save some for households, society, make sure this is equitable, and then what's left could be traded. I mean, this is how I, I wish it had gone. Um, but somehow when we need more, day, more energy, we just produce more energy <laughs> without looking at the carbon budget. Um, but, yeah, for, for data centres, I do think, you know, there has been some significant um, uh, advancement in terms of both renewable energy and re uh, energy efficiency and also policy. So I know that some of the tech co companies have lobbied for feed-in tariffs to be um, uh, introduced in the countries where they've brought the, the data centres. And technically they should be putting those data centres in countries where the climate is, is a bit conducive so um, they don't need as much cooling for, for those data centers. Um, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll pause and let others comment on this. Uh, let me respond to you. Uh, renewable energy, solar. I don't think solar is expensive. See, what is expensive is not so much solar. Solar itself, uh, costs have been coming down. The integration of solar into a larger energy system, that is where the expenses lie. Uh, whether uh, what are the modes you're going to do it because uh, when you come to especially the IT sector, if uh, Subrutu is going to run his uh, towers and telecommunication equipment, he needs power all the time. The sun doesn't shine all 24 hours a day. So then you get into problems of storage, whether you're going to do it through batteries and what you're going to do when power starts fluctuating. So grid management does become a major problem with solar. And no country really has been able to invest the amount of money which is required. We keep talking about smart grids, but smart grids are nowhere around in the picture, in the, in the framework. See, that's why I'm saying that when we, when we start talking of IR4 and the possibilities and the potential, that is one side. But the actual investments to do that kind of systems integration, that kind of data integration, there are major challenges there. 
and and see that is until we start talking about those until we start addressing those uh, the benefits of ir4 are not going to be in the as fast as you want them uh, and uh, you will be stuck where you are exactly so solar is not expensive solar today is very very viable very very feasible uh, it is uh, the larger systems the ability of the systems to actually absorb them. If you start uh, recalling every May, and in fact in October uh, last year again, electricity prices in Germany go negative. Why do they go negative? I mean, you are, you are being paid to consume electricity. Can you imagine a situation like that? They go negative because the grid can't handle it. it the fluctuations are so wild that until the grid can taper off and you know adjust itself uh, to in one energy source and taper down others. If that does not happen, you're going to keep on consuming and burning coal even while solar power is going to be fed into the grid. So you've not greened your grid. So see, that is the kind of systems approach. Yes, IR4 can move you in that direction. There's a long way to go there, but there are lots of other issues there uh, which we can separately discuss, including questions of data, sharing of data, collaboration across data, networks. There are hundreds of other issues there which need to be resolved. Would you like to pick up on any of the yes. questions? Uh, so I want to add uh, how to go through uh, greening tech or uh, we, should, we should focus on redirection of technology towards climate action to overcome the problem of carbon emission. This is uh, can starts for focusing in green uh, uh, towards uh, tech for good. And there is some initiative from uh, some vendors such as Huawei. Uh, they are now, uh, as they are now uh, the leaders uh, in 5G cloudification, virtualization. And next, uh, next uh, we will speak about 6G, they have uh, also some initiatives. Now they are focusing about take for nature. They are uh, reviewing uh, or uh, doing digital research about all the tech or uh, the, so the supply chain and the, the devices uses for uh, uh, a core radio network or core network. I speak about here uh, mobile communication. So here we speak about digital reset of overall supply chain to see, to check the source of energy and the outcome uh, of, uh, at the, the end user. So here we speak about uh, the routes to node zero from uh, different uh, initiatives, starting by some vendors uh, act, uh, who are the leaders uh, of 5G or 6G, uh, uh, if we speak about uh, industry 5.0. So Prato, do you have any remarks? Uh, no, I, I think taking on from what uh, uh, Sanjay mentioned, uh, what we are seeing in our sector and across the ICT is that the industry is extremely uh, positive that with AI, ML and IoT coming in, uh, we'll be able to have a better grasp of situation which we are today not able to address uh, through the normal way. I think uh, this power, when the load comes in, when the load comes down, when you generate, you will need more AI sensors to be in place and that is where we believe with 5G coming in, the, the, uh, the energy industry will deploy these sensors on the ground, both on the demand side and the supply side, and hope, we are confident that we will see this uh, normalization coming in, which will actually then help in the takeoff of this renewable energy. Otherwise, I uh, I agree with Sanjay, because if, unless we resolve that, our dependency on this fossil fuel will continue. So we are confident with AI, ML and coming in, India playing a very active role on the development of AI, ML, IoT solutions, sensors there. Uh, we believe we should be able to uh, address this challenge. Thanks so much. I want to conclude this with some reflection and I wanted to also uh, resonate with uh, the friend who asked the question from the, the standpoint of the activist, you know, the, the whole idea that um, there is the promise, you know, you might have smart grids, you might have IoT, you have carbon accounting financials, is that what you said? And all of that is, of course, in the realm of promise. But the reality, even at the level of public consciousness, is that we are really not in a position to recognize um, this kind of tension that you spoke about, Sanjay, between those who want to get onto the grid, you know, the questions of access and accessibility on the one hand, which continue to uh, be daunting and on the other uh, the ability that we have to really effectively and efficiently manage uh, you know the the future of the planet as it were uh, with not just responsibility but with care in that regard I think um, what comes to mind is, uh, that 
in this coming year, in 23 and in 24, the UN Secretary General has, you know, launched a, a call to the summit of the future. And I really wanted our panel to reflect on that one message for global governance. Because while I think a political economy analysis will tell you that the tension between people, planet, and prosperity or profit on the one hand is real, how do you break that stalemate? Because I think, yes, um, there is a trust deficit. The pandemic has only made it worse. The war has made it even worse. So we have to measure up and rise up uh, as a civilization. So what is that one message maybe in less than 20 seconds? And Janet, you're very well placed having been part of the UN system as well. Um, how do you break the stalemate? Because there is something here for, I think, reining in the reckless uh, machine, machine, machinization towards prosperity and profit somewhere. And I can't but help uh, think about the necessity to do so, you know. So maybe a 20 second message to the summit of the future. Okay. Um, if we can't do command and control, we set a target and just find a way to match it. I would say mandatory disclosure according to harmonized international standards, disclosure of everything, uh, put carbon accountants to work. Uh, we know the calories of the meals. We should also know the carbon footprint. When you buy something, you should know the carbon footprint. Uh, full disclosure and then unlock action from there. Thank you. Thanks. The message is carbon calories. <laughs> yes. No, uh, finding solutions to any problem is actually limited by current capacity to comprehend them. Uh, earlier in the, in the 60s, when we started talking about smog in cities, the answer was larger smokestacks. Build them higher and higher until it all came down as acid rain. But now you see you are in a position, you are actually at a phase where you start talking of knowledge networks. When you start talking of you know, the big words, collaborate, the buzzwords are collaborate and share and build, innovate, new kinds of knowledge network, sharing of data, sharing of systems, uh, you know, get into these exchanges and innovate at a level which is far beyond, quantumly beyond what you've been innovating. See, that is where the solutions lie. But for that, ultimately, you know, we keep talking of various commons and here I want to gladden the heart of the activists. I think the largest commons which we need to share is knowledge. And if you can get into a knowledge sharing network, Yes, you will have the solutions. That ultimately, if you talk of the holy grail, that is the holy grail. But to do that, to do that, IR4 may need to regress and go back to pre-industrial times where you knew every resource, as Janet said, where you, where you knew each and every resource, where it was coming from, where your water was coming from, where your electricity was coming from. And therefore, then you built a life on sustainability around local systems. So that is the challenge. So when you to count calories, that is what you do. Thank you. That's local accountability and the framework for sharing at the global level. Otherwise, face the toxic acid rain. So to reach neutrality of our net zero, we need a global conversation between uh, all United Nations uh, to raise awareness. Uh, and we need to state a KPI, uh, as I told uh, uh, first, because we need to know more uh, a transparency about the network emission because all of us now are uh, using uh, tech for uh, different fields. We speak now about the X technology. Uh, we need to state uh, specific metrics uh, about data environment of uh, or data collection. Uh, we need uh, a collaboration between different actors, research, and we, we need awareness in universities uh, too, because we have uh, to, we need uh, to uh, a new generation aware about uh, green tech, not only focusing on cloud or cybersecurity, IT, because planet is uh, necessary. It is the only place where we live. <laughs> <laughs> There's one planet, and, and I think the call for inter-UN agency collaboration has come up in the recent years yeah, yeah, yeah. very much more, and so and thank you very much for raising and it. And I want to add that uh, we have to follow uh, also, there is an important group of ITU, they are focusing about uh, climate action and how to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, so uh, it's necessary to focus in that group because standardization comes from uh, their recommendation. 
Yes, I think the, the place of standards and inter-UN agency collaboration is a very important message to take away. So, Brato, I'm putting you in a very difficult spot. Don't speak for Ericsson. Speak for yourself. Um, see, there's no running away from technology, right? Or the innovation. This is going to come. But I think what uh, what we are seeing, uh, and, or what I am seeing, is that there's a growing awareness and acknowledgement that you know, uh, you cannot continue what you have been doing. I think that's a good thing. We are also seeing a huge amount of coordination between governments, industry and ITU, at least as telecom I can speak, ITU has put the standards very clear. And so far we are not seeing a dissonance there. But what I would possibly uh, look at, uh, especially for uh, developing countries and underdeveloped countries, if there could be some kind of uh, you know, financing or funding mechanism so that those countries can be helped to move from energy consuming technologies, older generation energy consuming technologies to newer energy consuming technologies and not just them, even in India for example, can we look at uh, areas which are normally uh, uh, economically backward where normally uh, communication networks come later in the day, is there some way where government can actually incentivize the telecom operators to go and uh, roll out the new generation of technology because it does two things. One, it will help you to bridge the digital divide, which is a, uh, a parallel discussion. At the same time, it will help you to you know, reduce your energy consumption in those areas. Thank you, Subrato. Spoken like an activist, I completely <laughs> resonate with that because discussions about public finance have come back you know, square and center in the era of digital industrialization. You know, this is something that is also important to acknowledge at a global level, global public finance. Uh, just as my friend spoke about the digital public goods and global digital public goods, I think digital um, industrial financing is going to be an important frontier. And I think there it's very important that there is a bottom-up um, role for communities to play in order to then define uh, where that should go and who should really benefit from it. Thank you so much for an exciting discussion. It has been a very, very informative panel. I am quite an imposter, don't know anything about energy and climate, but I learned a lot. Thanks.